All right, so I wanted to give a quick introduction on how to write and apply response paper, which is one of the major assignments you have for the semester. And so if you look on the PowerPoint over here, you'll see there's a couple of steps. I try to break it down in a systematic way so it's easier to address uh, any concerns you have. Now, the first and uh, uh, foremost thing that I want to emphasize is that when you read the article that you're writing about, make sure you read it at least five times. Why? Well, it's something, is a technique that I was taught. When you read it the first time, it's likely you're not going to understand much. You're not going to get much information out of it. The second time you start to get kind of an idea of it, sort of the structure of it, how it starts off, how it ends. The third time you start to notice important areas. And that's where you start to get a better idea of what's important and what's not important to focus on in, in the paper. And the fourth time, that's when you uh, can mark it. You, already, you don't have to read the whole thing again since you already kind of like identified some important areas. You may put an asterisk next to it, a little star, or if you're writing the book, a little sticky tab or something. Just make sure you highlight those areas, you know, okay, this paragraph is important. And that's all you really have to do. Now, the fifth time you read it, that's when you break out your notebook. And so again, you don't have to read the entire thing again. Now you, you've already identified the important parts, right? You put a sticky note next to it. Go back, put them in your own words, give yourself some examples that make sense to you so you can help, it can help you remember you know, what's going on in that particular, so it makes sense to you. Now, you're also going to listen to or read or watch a real life scenario. So you're going to take what you learned in the article uh, that we covered, and I'm going to give you some sort of media where it's going to relate to that. And this is kind of the big point of the paper. I want to see if you can make connections between the two. You see how they're related to each other, how one helps understand the other. So then the first assignment I'm going to do uh, is a podcast, perhaps, and take a listen at that. Also, you're going to do the same thing. Don't just listen to one time. Maybe listen to more than once. Take notes. Jot down the important parts. Uh, also, since it's a podcast or a video, you know exactly what time, so you can cite it later. So you can write that. So let's say two minutes in, there's an important uh, speaker or somebody in the media, and you want to use that, you can, you know, jot that down. And then outline your paper. And this is extremely important because I've had a lot of students, and I used to do this when I first started college, and it was a big mistake, and I learned very quickly that it's very difficult and not impossible to write a good paper without an outline. So don't just simply go in front of the computer and start typing and expect it. It's all, it's all going to make sense. It's all going to come together for you. Rather, most important thing is to actually section out, outline, break it down into pieces where it's easy to manage. And then once you do that, putting your paper together, it's extremely easy because all the pieces are in place. Now you just have to work on transitioning and making sure that it flows. Those are the basic things you have to do. And then finally, proofread. It's already went through uh, an initial revision, right? You already kind of thought about it, structured it. Now make sure you go over it and have somebody else as well go over it. I highly recommend that. We have writing centers, tutors, you know, available to you. So use those uh, assets uh, for your advantage. Um, you're paying for them in a sense because they're part of your tuition. So why not use those tools to help you get a better grade, right? So let's go a little bit in detail about the outline. How would the outline? So for this kind of paper, what I'm looking for is first you explain the theory of the paper overall. What is the main issue that they're uh, discussing in the paper? And that might be for our first example, uh, cultural relativism. 
Maybe that's the ethical theory that they're really talking about. And maybe the author has an argument related to that. So, for example, Gensler has four objections. He's not a fan of cultural realism. He has four reasons why there are problems with cultural realism. He lays them out, right? So if that was the case, then take, summarize that. Explain that to your reader. They didn't read. Imagine that your reader had no previous experience. They didn't read the article. They didn't read the papers like you did. So you're going to have to break it down in a way where it's easy to understand. And you're going to give them a good summary of what you read. And then next, you're going to do the same thing with the podcast or newspaper article or video or whatever I provided for you, whatever media. Break it down as well in the same way. So, you know, what's the paper talking about first? Second, what's the podcast maybe talking about? You know, what are the important elements there? You don't have to write every single detail, but you want to give them, start working as you can see how one relates to the other. You're starting to slowly uh, be very picky about what you choose to include in your paper and making sure that it's relevant and connected to, you know, the initial paper, that they're both, uh, you're showing a good relation between both of them, where are the connections. And then finally, this is where you really give a good response. So provide analysis. So the first part is kind of summarizing, one and two are summarizing information, and three is where you provide your own analysis. This is where I want, really want to see you think and engage with the material. So how does the situations in the podcast, for example, regard like when it talks about American football or whatever the podcast is, how are those good examples of the problems Gensler finds in cultural realism? How do they relate to cultural realism? How are they uh, problematic? So you kind of telling me how this real life situation is related to what this philosopher is talking about in this paper. And I, I want to see those clear connections because overall, like I said, how I'm trying to judge and this is how I'm determining the break. Do you really understand, you know, what the philosopher was talking about and how I gauge that is how well can you relate that to a real life scenario? So that's the overall outline which you were to work on. Break it down in pieces as I have, and it becomes a lot easier. So after that, you can put it together and then the proofreading. See how if you take it step by step, this is much better than just sitting in front of a computer and trying to write off the top of your head. It's very frustrating and it takes very long, and it's probably not as good as you could have. If you had planned it out, right? It worked, broke apart the work. So I, I do also want to give a note on paraphrasing. So when you paraphrase, when and you've probably heard it before when people say to paraphrase is to put in your own words. Well, what does that mean? It's kind of vague, right? It doesn't mean you're just gonna change some of the words around. You know, it's like, oh well, they started with this, but I'll start with the second sentence first. And it doesn't mean, well, I'll just take out some stuff. Like, I'll just take out the second sentence. I'll leave the first sentence of what you said. And that's not really your own words, because it doesn't really show that you understand it. It just simply kind of a copy and paste job of what already has been done. And so why we don't like that is that because when you do that, you're not really demonstrating that you understood the material if the person or yourself was confused with the original material and you tried to put it a copy and paste sort of routine on that, well, that's not going to help them in the in your paper, right? Because if they were confused the first time and then they read your paper and it says the same exact word by word, you know, verbatim, you know, paragraph, then they're not going to become any clearer with that. How you want to paraphrase now. Now work through an example with you. So David Hume is a very famous philosopher. And in this uh, example here, this, this quote, he says, all the perceptions of human of the human mind resolve themselves into two distinct kinds, but they shall call impressions and ideas. 
The difference betwixt these consists in the degree of force and liveliness with which they strike upon the mind and make their way through our thought or consciousness. These perceptions, which enter with the most force and violence, we may name impressions. And under this name, I comprehend all our sensations, passions, and emotions as they make their first appearance in the soul. By ideas, I mean the faint images of these in thinking and reasoning. Okay, that was a lot. And you might be confused. Well, what is he talking about? Well, let's look at a bad example. This is what I was saying right now. You don't want to simply copy and paste a lot of it or just take out some sentences but leave the rest. Because if we say, well, Hume says all perceptions of the mind are resolved into two kinds, impressions and ideas. The difference between is in the, how much force and liveliness they have in our thoughts and consciousness. The perception with the most force and violence are impressions. And these are sensations, passions, and emotions. Ideas are the faint images of our thinking and reasoning. See if it's confusing in the first quote. And this bad example, well, you're still confused, right? Because they're essentially saying the same exact thing word by word. Now, what does a good example look like? We can say this. Hume, Hume says that there are two kinds of perceptions or mental states. He calls these impressions and ideas. An impression is a very forceful quote, mental state, like the sensory impression one has when looking at a red apple. So you see the object there and you're looking at it and it's in your mind, right? An idea is a less forceful mental state, like the idea one has of an apple while just thinking about it rather than looking. So close your eyes and imagine what an apple looks like, right? That's an idea. It's not so clear what he means here by forceful. He might mean, and notice what they do at the end. Sometimes the writer isn't completely clear, right? And does leave, a, they're not perfect either. They may leave a lot of ambiguity. So you might point that out and it's fine to point that out in your writing. It's like, well, it wasn't quite clear what he meant by forceful. But I think he might mean, and, you, and that's part of your own analysis. That's where you're showing me. You're really thinking about what you're reading. And notice the example is really helpful. That's the main difference, right, between the bad and good example is the example of a red apple. And no, it's an everyday sort of thing that people can kind of uh, relate to. It's not very complicated. Everybody's, most people have seen an apple or seen some sort of object, right? And versus closing their eyes and thinking about it. So it's something really relatable and easy to understand. So that's what I'm talking about. A good paraphrase is you're breaking it down into an easier format instead of just chopping it down, but leaving it essentially the same. So also note, and this is what I'll point out right, as well as we're gonna to get to, is it's important also to properly give credit to right, or cite, as we would say, in a paper. And notice what I have here. So Hume, page 38. Because why do I send it in the text like that? Because you have to know who we're talking about, what book, where was this book? Where is this information coming from? Which book are we referring to, right? So it's, and notice, of course, it's not my own words. The example because I'm saying Hume says, right? I'm referring to the person. They said this, but where did they say this? They said this in their book on page 30. And that's what I'll also be looking for. So let's talk a little bit about citations, in text citations in particular. So you will have to cite in the paper. Now you're welcome to use MOA or APA. Those are two format styles uh, to choose from. You can see that MOA is typically used in, in the humanities, like English classes, art classes, when you're writing about something. And APA is usually used in the sciences, like psychology or sociology. So they have their own writing style. Now, I'm open, uh, depending on your major, maybe you're a science major, maybe you're a humanities major, I'm open to for you to choose which citation style you're more comfortable with. That's fine. But once you choose one, you do have to stick with it and you do have to follow the rules. So notice what, what are some of the rules? And there's a great link here I've left on a copy of this PowerPoint, Al Purdue. 
excellent website, explains all the rules about citations for that format, how to cite to give you examples. So check that out, make sure you take a look. But quick summary, look at the work cited page. So your very last page in the paper should be a citation page. You're telling me where you got all this information from, where all the books or articles did you use for this paper? And if it's an MLK style, you're going to give me a work cited page. That's going to be the title of the last page in your paper. Now, if it's an APA, you're going to put references on the top. Now, with a work cited page, you're going to cite the last name and then the first name. So they give you a silly example there, right? Big Bird, but it's going to be Bird, but his last name, right? Comma, Big. In a work cited page in EPA style, you put the initial. So bird, comma, B, period. Now, when you're both using uh, parentheses, right? You're, you're blocking off like I did in that example. And we are in the quote. Notice what they say. You can put bird, comma, the year that the paper was written or the book was written, or the page number, bird and the page number. Now notice there are a little bit differences here. With the MLA style, what you want to do is when you cite the author's name is listed within the sentence, place the page number down at the end. So like we said right, so right now, according to Big Bird, writing centers are awesome. And then they gave me the page number, right? Okay? I could do that. If I'm doing uh, APA style, I can say when I cited uh, the name is listed within the sentence, place the year, and the material was published. So big word, and I could put in parentheses the year that book was, believes that writing centers are awesome. Now, when information is cited, uh, listed alphabetically in your citation page. So we're going from the last name, right? So the A's would come first and the B's. When the information is cited, the author's name is not listed, place the author's last name in the page number at the end. So notice what you did at the example here. Writing centers are awesome. And you could have done it like I did, bird, and then the page 22. Or if you do MOAs, you can put Writing centers are awesome, bird, comma, and the year. Now, if you have a big book, mm -hmm. be careful. I don't want you to use big chunks of quotes and just copy and stick them in there. One, it's because it's poor writing. Uh, a lot of problems come about when you just assume that your audience, your reader, understands what you're trying to say. They already totally figure out and you're on the same page. That's usually not the case. You're actually guiding somebody step by step, you know, holding their, their hand as you go through these ideas of yours. So what you don't want to do is give them a big quote so that they, they can interpret their own way. If that happens, they may not interpret the quote in the way you thought they should have. It might go against what you're trying to say in the paper. So make sure that you're explaining after a quote, well, why is it important? What does this quote mean? You know, don't let them, it's not a murder mystery. You don't let them try to put the clues together. Explain everything to them. And if you're citing lines, I don't recommend you do, but if you're citing lines that are four lines long or more, like a quote that's longer than four lines, you should have it in its own little block and then first and put it in its own little block. Um, if you're doing APA style, uh, quotes for 40 words are more indented, five spaces. So just keep in mind those little differences, but you still, again, have to cite in the text. So, you know, you have this big quote, but at the end, you still have to have bird 22 or whatever. So those are just some of the things. They're not all the rules out there. It's going to take practice. There's a lot of great examples I mentioned on the website that you can see. 
uh, to take a look at. But make sure you have these bases, get familiar with it. That's what the tutoring writing centers are for as well. You can come to me, I can see a copy before you turn it in, or you can seek help uh, with any of the resources on that the school provides. Now, how am I going to grade this assignment? I have a rubric that I use to break down how everybody gets graded and what I'm looking for. So the first thing is format. Did you meet all the parts of the checklist, the requirements that I stipulated? I said, well, paper has to have this, this, and this. So make sure you go through my checklist. I have it like in little boxes in, on the assignment explanation and instructions. Make sure that you're covering every single instruction. Don't leave anything out. Page number, font, all that should be covered. If you leave out some stuff, you forgot to put the page numbers, um, those are points that I'm gonna start taking off but that will affect your grade overall. Grammar as well. So this is college, I'm looking for, you know, well thought out, you know, clear, concise ideas. And that means that you thought about it, you went over it and you just didn't, like I mentioned before, just get in front of the screen and start typing. Make sure you have it checked by somebody else. You read it out loud. Um, you took it to a writing center. Uh, I believe they have help online as well, so you don't have to go in person, but they're always that you can get help. Now, organization. What I want to see here is there's a clear connection. So, in short, did you follow the outline that it provided? So going back real quick, is do you have a clear structure like this? Did you explain what the paper was about in the first place? Did you explain what the podcast or the video was about? And did, how, did you, in third, did you put it all together? Did you explain how they're related? What did they have to do? Did you give me examples? You know, those type of things. If you follow the structure, for the most part, I think you'll be good. If, again, if you kind of like, well, I don't need an outline, I'll just write it. Um, so usually it doesn't turn out very good because what happens, I've noticed, the students is that they'll be typing and they're like, oh, I completely forgot to put that in there. And then they'll just keep typing and then put that in there because they just remembered. But notice how that doesn't make sense to me as, a, as an audience, right? So I'm reading going along with you and then suddenly this idea pops out of nowhere and it's really out of place, but you brought it up and now, now I'm trying to figure out well, why is it there? You see how that doesn't work. You want to plan things out. So organization is key. And then the last part is going to be uh, reasons, examples, objections, responses. This is part, all part of the analysis. Did you really give me good connections of how the paper is related to the podcast or the video. Did you explain well, you know, why this person is what they said, this quote or whatever, is related to what Gensler said, for example, the philosopher said in his paper. Like that's the analysis part. So there's four parts here, the formatting, the grammar, organization, and the analysis and the responses, the examples, reasons that you gave, those are the things I'll be grading. So if you have any further questions or anything like that, please let me know. I'll also put a link up uh, for the writing centers and any other resources that you can use to help you along the way.